So one day a young mother was uh, feeling rather down and hopeless. Maybe some of you, when you were a young mother, remember those moments. All of a sudden she heard the phone ring. She answered the phone, said, hello. And a woman's voice quickly said, hey, hey honey, it's mom. I called because I know you're overwhelmed with the three children. And I want to give you some help. I'm going to stop by to clean the house, take care of the baby, prepare dinner for when the boys get home from school. I want you to get ready to go to my beautician. I paid her already. She's going to give you the works. Your appointment is at 1. Give George a call at the office. Tell him you'll meet him at the Cheesecake Factory for dinner. My treat. The young mother interrupted, saying, uh, George, who's George? And the woman on the phone said, well, George is your husband, of course. And the young mother said, my husband's name is John. And the woman said, is this 555-3212? And the young mother said, no, this is 555-2212. The woman said, oh, I must have the wrong number, sorry. There was a long pause, and the young mother said, does this mean you're not coming over to help me? <laughs> oh, there are those times when exhausted young mothers need hope, and they need help. And there are those times when people feel hopeless because there, there are far too many bills and far too little cash. Then there's those times when we feel hopeless because we've gone to the doctor. And the diagnosis is cancer. And they say there's really nothing we can do. There's those times we feel hopeless because perhaps the company or your spouse says to you that the relationship isn't working out. They need to go in a different direction without you. On August the 12th, 2000, the largest submarine in the Russian fleet, named the Kursk, it suffered an internal explosion and it went under to the bottom at 350 feet in the Barents Sea. 118 men were aboard. So deep sea divers went down to where the submarine was. They were trying to figure out if anybody had survived the explosion and they heard this pinging. They realized it was someone inside. They were using kind of a Morse code. And they listened carefully. And what was being sent was the message, Is there any hope? You'd want to know that if you were stuck in a submarine on the bottom, wouldn't you? But that's a question that a lot of people ask. Maybe we ask at times, Is there any hope? Where do we go? when hope seems to be running dry. Well, today I want us to point us to really the same place I've been pointing us to throughout the whole series that we've been in, this sermon series. I want to point us to God and the promises of God that give us hope. The Hebrew writer says there in Hebrews 6, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. And Jesus has entered there on our behalf as the forerunner. Now, none of us need to be told what an anchor is for, right? Maybe you've held an anchor in your hands when you've been out on a boat. Maybe you've thrown one over the side of the boat and felt it when it catches that pull, that sudden jerk when it catches a firm and secure place. Anchors have one purpose, and the purpose is to hold the boat fast, to, to steady the boat. And we all need a good anchor in order to be able to weather the wind and the storms of life. We need one that can hook securely to an object that's stronger than the storm. And why do we need a good anchor? Because we are a valuable vessel. We're carrying a valuable commodity, and that valuable commodity is our soul. 
When God breathed into Adam, the first man, He breathed more than just air and oxygen. He breathed into him a soul. And it's the presence of the soul that separates us from the animals. Now, I know many of you have pets. Many of you love your pets, whether they're dogs or cats or goldfish or whatever kind of pet you have. And certainly, we have a lot in common with our pets. There, there are things we share in common, like, like most of our pets and us, we have eyes and ears, we have tongues and mouths, right? Some of you even look like your pet, right? Some of you act like your pet. But although there may be very many things we have in common, there's one huge difference between us and our pets. We have a soul, and they don't. And because we have a soul, we wonder why we're here. Our soul causes us to think about where we're headed. Because of our soul, we wrestle with what's right and what's wrong. And we value the lives of others. And we get nostalgic when we think about the good old days. Animals don't do those kind of things. And so our souls separate us from the animals, but it is our souls that unite us with God. And our souls need an anchor. Our souls are fragile. Our souls feel the pain of death. Our souls feel the concerns about the future. Our liver may suffer from a tumor, but our soul suffers from the questions. And that's why our souls need an anchor, an anchoring, an anchoring point that's sturdier than any storm we face. Now notice, the Hebrew writer said that our anchor is set in the inner sanctuary, behind the curtain where Jesus, our forerunner, has entered on our behalf. In other words, our anchor is set in the very throne room of God. And I want you to picture your anchor being anchored to the very throne of God. And no matter what storm or attack that comes against us, the anchor of the promises of God, spoken from the very throne of God, give us hope and keep us strong. Let's review for a minute the promises we've been looking at through the sermon series. When the wave of death sweeps into our life, we can cling to the promise that death is not the end of life. Death has been swallowed up in victory. When the attacks come against our self-image, we can cling to the promise that you are somebody special to God, that I am somebody special to God. He made us in His image. And He loves us very much. When the storms sap our strength and exhaust our resources, we can remember that we are children of God, co-heirs with Christ. We have a spiritual, heavenly inheritance that is inexhaustible. And when the attacks of Satan come against us, we can remember the devil is a defeated foe. God will give us the strength and the power to overcome the devil. And when the attacks of doubt and failure come, we can hold on to the promise that Jesus understands us. And because He understands us, He can help us. And when we feel alone with our struggles and problems, we can cling to the promise that Jesus is at the right hand of God interceding for us. Jesus prays for you and for me. And not only do we have Jesus, but in addition to our Savior interceding, we have the promised Holy Spirit who lives in us and empowers us and also intercedes for us. And in addition to the Savior interceding and the promised Holy Spirit, we're also promised that our prayers have power. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. That's God's promise. Now in this world we may face injustice and suffering. Life isn't fair. 
But God's promise is someday he'll work all that out, right? He'll make it right. In the end, justice will prevail. God promises that. And we're also promised that our sorrow won't last forever. Even though we face sorrow and go through sorrow, it doesn't last forever. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. And if we begin to feel like the powerful and the prideful always end up on top, and that God has no place for the small people, remember God's promise. He resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And then finally, if we fear that God can't or that God won't forgive our sins, we're reminded of the promise. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let's stay in Christ Jesus, right? Let's hold on to the promises of God. Nothing and no one can take away our hope because nothing and no one can take away our Jesus. Neither sin nor death, neither betrayal nor sickness, nor disappointment can overcome the promises of God if we cling to the promises of God. And that's what God asks us to do, right? To cling to His promises. That's what a man named Jonathan McComb did. He clung to the promises of God. The McCombs were the picture of an all-American family. They had a terrific marriage, two young, beautiful children. Jonathan worked ranches, and Laura worked pharmaceuticals. They were God-fearing. They were happy. They were busy. They were carefree. But then came the storm. Now, the forecast included rain. But no one had anticipated a once-in-a-century flood. No one saw it coming. The, the Blanco River rose 28 feet in 90 minutes. And it roared through the South Texas hills, taking with it homes and cars and bridges. Jonathan and his family sought refuge on the second story of a cabin they had rented place they had never rented before. But safety was nowhere to be found. The house was yanked off its foundation. They found themselves clutching a mattress as they roared through white water rapids. Jonathan survived, but no one else did. Not his wife, not his children, Max Licato says that when he and his wife visited Jonathan in the hospital, he could barely move from his pain. But the broken ribs and the broken hip were nothing compared to his broken heart. Jonathan tried to talk, but could only muster tears. Now, a couple of weeks later, he found the strength to speak at the funeral of his wife and his children. It seemed the entire city of Corpus Christi, Texas was present. The church had no empty seats, no dry eyes. For more than half an hour, he described his wife and children, spoke of their laughter and joy, and how empty the house had become. And then he said these words, and I quote, People have been asking me how I'm doing and how I can stay so strong and positive in a time like this. And I've told them I've been leaning on my family, friends, and most importantly, on my faith. After church every Sunday, Laura would always ask, how can we get more people to come to church and learn about salvation? Well, Laura, what do you think? They're here. A particular verse I've loved over the years has also helped me along. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5. I have no explanation for why such a tragic event like a flood takes place and lives are lost, but I know 
that God is not going to give us anything we can't handle. I know that we are here for a little while, but trust me, if I could have every bone broken in my body to have them back, I would do it. But it's not our call. Yes, I know that this entire tragedy is horrible. I have been angry, upset, confused, and left to wonder why. I've cried enough tears to fill that river up a hundred times. But I know that I can't stay angry or upset or confused or continue to ask myself why because I will find out that answer when my time comes and I'm reunited with them in heaven. But trust me, that will be the first question I ask. Unquote. Whenever we face tragedy or struggle or loss, there are always many many things we don't know. We often don't know why everything happens, at least on this side of eternity. But we can't allow the things we don't know to overshadow or to overpower the things that we do know. And did you notice how Jonathan was very clear about that? He was clear about what he did not know and about the things he did know. He wasn't naive. He wasn't being dismissive. He didn't respond with a superficial or some kind of shallow faith. He readily admitted what happened to his wife and children was a horrible tragedy and that he didn't know why it had happened. But he chose to focus on the things that he did know. He knew that God does not give us anything we can't handle. He knew that we are only here for a little while. And he knew that someday he would be reunited with his loved ones in heaven and that all his questions would be answered at that time. He found no easy answers, but he found the answer, right? And the answer is God and God's promises. He made the deliberate decision to build his life on God's promises, the things he knew. And that's what God wants all of us to do. So Jesus encourages us in Luke 18, 1, always pray and never lose hope. I like that. And Paul prayed for the Roman church there in Romans 15, 13, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So notice Paul believes that our God is a God of hope. You see that? And Paul believes that our God of hope can fill us so much that we will overflow with hope. Now other translations use the word abound. And that's a good word too, right? Abound with hope. There are many things in life that we want to receive in an abounding kind of way, in an overflowing way, in an abundant way, right? We want an, un, we want a, we want a, a abundant overflowing harvest. Bushels just, just pouring over, right? When we go to the waterfall, we don't want to see a trickle of water coming over that thing. We want to see it abounding and overflowing with water. And when we have that bowl of ice cream, right? We want it to abound. We want it to overflow. At least I do. Maybe, maybe I'm different, right? I want a big bowl of ice cream. God wants our hope to be like that. Overflowing. Abounding. Abundant. But where do we find that kind of hope? Well, only in God, right? In the God of hope. Let's go back to the scripture reading from Hebrews 6. And notice again that our anchor is anchored in the throne room of God. Because God wanted to show His unchangeable purpose even more clearly to the heirs of the promise, He guaranteed it with an oath. So that through two unchangeable things, 
in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to seize the hope set before us. And we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Jesus has entered there on our behalf as a forerunner. So the Hebrew writer wants us to know that God's promises are true. That God cannot lie when He makes promises. And He wants us to flee for refuge. Don't you love that terminology? You can just picture someone fleeing and running to a place of safety. Flee for refuge to God and His promises. And there we'll find strong encouragement. How about that? Strong encouragement. He says, seize the hope that God has given. I like how Eugene Peterson paraphrased this in the message. Grab the promised hope with both hands and never let go. It's an unbreakable spiritual lifeline. Reaching past all appearances, right to the very presence of God, where Jesus, running ahead of us, has taken up His permanent post as high priest for us. That's good advice, right? Grab the promises of God with both hands and never let go. God has promised that His promises are an un breakable spiritual lifeline, an anchor, an anchor that is, that is grounded in the very presence of God, His throne, where Jesus has His permanent position. And so, ultimately, Jesus is the only person who's worthy to be our anchor. Everyone anchors themselves to something. Think about that for a minute, right? Everyone anchors themselves to something. Some people anchor themselves to themselves, right? They trust nobody or nothing else. No, nothing other than themselves. Other people anchor themselves to other people. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a spouse. Some anchor themselves to a preacher or maybe a celebrity. Other people anchor themselves to things. Maybe it's a bank account. Or maybe it's a retirement account. Or a house. Or their health. The question we must ask ourselves is, is what I'm hooked to stronger than what I will go through? Right? Is what I am hooked to stronger than what I will go through? If it's not, then the storm's going to get you, right? Well, let me ask you. Would you anchor your boat to another boat? No, you want to be anchored to something stronger and deeper and more secure than another boat that's just floating along, right? Right? If we hook ourselves to anything other than Jesus, then what we're hooked to isn't strong enough to carry us through the storms of life or the questions of eternity. So when we anchor ourselves to the things of this world, people and other things, it's like a boat tethering itself to another boat. Can a retirement account weather a depression? Probably not. Can good health weather a disease? Not likely. These anchors offer no guarantee. So experienced sailors would urge us to hook on something that's hidden, something deep and secure and solid, not tether yourself to another boat. Don't even trust the boat that you're in. When the storm hits, we should trust nothing and no one but God alone. And I like, this is what Paul said. When he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.10, he said, we have put our hope in the living God. Who else is worthy for us to put our hope in? 
other than the living God. God and His promises are the only things worthy of our trust. His promises are trustworthy and true, and they work, right? They're time-tested. The promises of God and the hope they deliver can walk us through horrific tragedies and also buoy us in the day-to-day -day struggles that we face. Russell Kelso Carter was a man who believed in God, a man who believed in God's promises. He experienced the truths that we're talking about today. Russell was a gifted athlete and student. In 1864, at the age of 14, during a prayer meeting, he decided to give his life to the Lord. He became an instructor at the Pennsylvania Military Academy in 1869. He led a diverse and fruitful life that included stints as a minister, as a medical doctor, and also as a songwriter. But it was Russell's understanding of God's promises that makes his story relevant to us today. See, at the age of 30, he developed a critical heart condition. He was on the brink of death. Connie Ruth Christensen writes this about it. He knelt and made a promise that healing or no, his life would finally and forever be consecrated to the service of the Lord. And Christensen goes on to say that from that moment on, the Scripture took on new life for Russell. He began to lean on the promises he found in the Bible. He committed himself to believe whether or not God granted him healing. And guess what? Russell lived another 49 years. But Russell's decision to trust God in the midst of his difficulties gave birth to a hymn that many of us love to sing. Certainly I do. You'll recognize the words, and we're going to sing it in just a minute. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. So I want to end this sermon series with the last words of Max Licato's book that I've been using as a resource on the promises of God. And this is the way Max ends his book. Build your life on the promises of God. Since His promises are unbreakable, I have a typo there, your hope will be unshakable. The winds will still blow, and the rain will still fall, but in the end, you will be standing, standing on the promises of God. So I hope all of us have been experiencing that in our lives taking God at His Word, standing on His promises. And I hope this series has reminded us of some of those very important promises. We haven't even begun to touch on all of them, right? We, we, did, we did 13 or 14 of them or something like that. The, the book is full of other ones too. So seek them out. Grab hold of them with both hands. Don't let go. Let's be standing on the promises of God.